Good afternoon. Um, now, I know that many of you are aware of some of the great things we're doing in New York City with data and technology. We have the work of Mike Flowers and his Office of Data Analytics, and we all saw his <coughs> smiling mug a little earlier today, uh, our open data initiatives. But I suspect that when it comes to the New York City criminal justice system, what many of you may think of is this. And we all know the police who investigate crime, the district attorneys who prosecute the offenders, and maybe a dozen or so trials a year that are ripped from the headlines. But the reality is that there's a lot more to it than that. And in fact, the city's criminal justice system handles over 350,000 cases per year. Fewer than 5% of them actually go to trial. Most of those cases are a lot less dramatic than what you see on Law & Order. Most of those cases involve a lot more in the way of complicated social issues. And all of these cases involve a whole bunch of people that you may not see on TV. Just running through quickly, we have not just one prosecutor, we have six local prosecutors. We have over a dozen courthouses. We have six individual defense organizations providing legal services for those who can't afford them. We've got a Department of Probation, Department of Corrections. And most importantly, at least for today's conversation, we have a network of service organizations who are providing alternatives to incarceration for thousands of New Yorkers every day. For our office, we have been committed to increasing the use of those ATI programs, these community-based programs for defendants who can be identified and safely supervised in the community and receive social services instead of jail or prison. So this year, we almost doubled the program slots that we had and expanded the programmatic options. And we started thinking about if we could do a better job with these programs through the use of data. Giving our partners, the ones who actually administer the programs, the tools to track and report on their cases and enabling us at the mayoral level to better evaluate the programs we have and identify the programs we might need. And this is all of a piece with our general approach to data and information, collecting it, making it accessible to improve our city's criminal justice system. Last year, we launched our indicator report project. This compiles data on indicators of system performance, critical indicators for everything from case outcomes to how quickly individual actors are reaching those outcomes and making it accessible and clear, not just to the criminal justice players themselves, but to the public. It's actually on our website, nyc.gov. We had built our data share platform. This permits real-time information exchange between and among the various criminal justice actors. And on top of that infrastructure, we built an application called e-arraignment. This took an archaic fax and paper-based system, all devoted to getting documents together for a defendant's first appearance in court, integrated those documents electronically, queues them for distribution, and allows us to monitor that process from start to finish with a bird's eye view. We look at what's working, and we can identify bottlenecks to move quickly. And with 350,000 cases in the queue, we've got to move quickly. So when the opportunity arose to partner with Code for America, as well as the Arnold Foundation and Blue Ridge, whose support we really appreciate, we're very, very grateful for, we had the goal of finding new ways to use data and information, and this time with a goal of making decision-making by the system actors better and more efficient. And so we got our three fellows, and I have to tell you, I am very, very proud of these folks because they really dug into the criminal justice system. They met with folks from the top to the bottom. They met with beat cops. They met with defense attorneys and prosecutors right there in the courtrooms, all the way to supervising judges in the five boroughs of the city of New York and the criminal justice coordinator himself. And in the end, they identified a very discreet need that we had, a very clever way to meet that need, and they built an application that I believe can have a major lasting impact on how we do the very important business of criminal justice in the city. And Ezra Spears is going to tell you a little bit about it. Thanks, Jordan. And none of this would have been possible without Jordan's really excellent guidance and, and, and everything that he's done for us has been amazing. So um, I'd like to introduce you to Allison. And she's second from the right in this photo. Um, this is with her with her staff. And she's a... Uh, clinical psychologist based in New York who works for an organization called CASES. It's the Center for Alternative Sentencing and Employment, uh, and Employment Services. She runs a program called Manhattan Start, which is one of about a, about a dozen of these programs contracted by the city of New York to provide alternatives to incarceration. 
These ATI programs identify defendants who are good candidates for rehabilitation in the community, instead of in jail or in prison, and connects them with the services that they need to get a fresh start. These are services like addiction treatment, um, mental health counseling, uh, education and employment opportunities and housing referrals. These programs in New York City serve thousands of defendants every year of many different types. The Manhattan Start focuses in particular on men who are being charged in Manhattan with misdemeanors, it's a lot of M's, um, who have a history of committing those kinds of low-level crimes and who also have a history of mental illness. So for a person like that, someone like Allison and a program like Manhattan Start represents a chance and maybe even a last chance at getting the help they need to really turn things around. But Allison faces a big challenge. One of her jobs and her role as the program manager for Manhattan Start is to find the people, find the defendants who will enter her program. How does she do it? Well, she looks through court documents like these, uh, reams and reams of them, to try to find people that meet her basic eligibility criteria. Now, these documents are scattered around, so she has to constantly run from courtroom to courtroom, from the courthouse to her office, just to find eligible candidates. And once she finds these people, she has to meet with them. She talks to these defendants, she talks to their attorneys, the judges, and the prosecutors managing their case to figure out, does this person have a need or program can address? Should, she, should these people be enrolled? It's in those conversations where she's making an enormous difference, where she's bringing her psychology, her psychology training um, to really uh, contribute a lot to this process. But she's spending so much time going through paperwork, she's trying to find needles in this haystack. But with a haystack as big and as unwieldy as this, she might not find all of the, the, the eligible defendants that are in there. So, as a fellowship team, we thought to ourselves, what can we do? Is there a way technology can help solve this problem? And it turns out that all of the paper documents that Allison was using in court are already digitized as a part of New York City's e-arraignment initiative. And so we built NYC Criminal Case Search. It's a simple, elegant, and secure way for Allison to search this data in real time to find all of the eligible defendants that meet the criteria. So let me quickly run through how it works. So if I were Allison and I were starting my day, I'd load up criminal case search, and I might see uh, 2,500 matching defendants in the New York City court system. Now for Manhattan Start, I'm going to start by focusing in on just those cases that are active in Manhattan. And then I'll dig in based on the criteria for my program. So people who have been charged with misdemeanors, men, 18 years of age or older. And then I'd be able to search based on their criminal history, three or more previous criminal convictions. But we're going to uncheck violent felony because Allison's program isn't appropriate for those, for those individuals. Finally, I would focus in on the people who are going to be in court today because this is the most important priority for me. Uh, these are the people I can get to now. Now, this is just one example of a search I could do, but there are a dozen other ATI programs and a dozen other searches that this will be able to handle. So this narrows it down significantly. There are 13 matching defendants in this list, and now I have everything I need to do to do an initial screen of these individuals. I have their name and identifying information so I can follow up. I have information about what charge they've been uh, charged with and even tells me what, it, what it's called, if I have to figure out those numbers mean. I have information about their criminal history and some indicators. I can even sort this list by courthouse, or as we say in New York, court part. Um, so I don't have to run back and forth between so many different rooms. Finally, I can export this list to my computer or mobile device, sort it, filter however I need to, and make sure that I contact every attorney, every defendant that I need to today. The impacts of this are really threefold for ATI programs and for the city. In accessibility, it used to be that the only way you'd have access to this data is in paper in a courtroom. And with criminal case search, ATI programs and people like Allison will have the ability to access information, sure, from courtrooms, but now from their offices and from their mobile devices. And since we engaged with a number of these providers as we were building the application, we know it has the specific data points they need to, to, they need to have to take action, and we know it's going to work for them. 
efficiency. With the amount of time that people aren't spending going through paperwork, they're going to be able to do what they do best, which is connect people with services, outreach to attorneys and judges, and make their programs more impactful themselves. And oversight. Allison isn't the only person who can run this search. So can her colleagues, so can her superiors. This, gives, this, this, this makes it possible to, to, to ensure that no eligible defendants for any program are getting left behind and getting missed. It also gives people like Jordan and system actors the ability to sort of take a bird's eye view about what's happening throughout alternative to incarceration throughout the city. Th thanks, Ezra. I, I, we're running out of time, but I just wanted to make one somewhat meta point to the room, and it's about process and this Code for America process that we had. You know, we came into this very proud of what we've been doing and our approach that we've been taking. It turned out that we were not leveraging the data that we had and the infrastructure that we had built to its fullest potential. We had built this e-arraignment project to compile the documents, move them down a queue, and simply to track how long it took to do it. And we did a very good job of that. We didn't do it to analyze the underlying data or to surface that data for interested parties. It took a fresh perspective. It took new eyes to identify a problem that we had and to show us that we could solve it, and we could solve it using materials that we already had in hand. So I'm very grateful to Code for America and specifically to the fellows. And I guess my parting lesson to you guys is don't be afraid to let the kids look under the hood. Thank you very much. Thank you.